Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. Today's session is Journeys of the Indian Art Film, its role in post-colonial public life. Today's uh, is a conversation between an author and a historian who are both invested in the histories of cinema and the city, Kolkata in particular, uh, using ideas in the book, Art Cinema and India's Forgotten Futures as a Fulcrum, Amit Chaudhary and Roshna Majumdar discuss the role of art films in post-colonial public life. The project of Indian art cinema began in the years following uh, independence in 1947, at once evoking the global reach of the term art film and speaking to the aspirations of the new nation state. Analyzing the films of Ray, uh, Sen and Ghatak and working through previously unexplored archives of uh, film society publications, uh, Rachna Majumdar offers a radical interpretation of Indian film history in her book, uh, Art Cinema and India's Forgotten Futures, offers sweeping new insights into film's relationship with the post-colonial condition and its role in de uh, decolonizing imaginations of the future. Uh, and uh, uh, the full uh, bios of both the speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, please feel free to uh, post your questions, comments, and observations uh, in the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And uh, I hand it over to our speakers. Thank you, uh, Lekha. And um, um, thank you, Bangalore International Center, for arranging this. And uh, Rochana, thank you for asking me to uh, you know, be part of this, this evening, for us evening, for you morning, right? Um, yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, so the, the way uh, we're going to do this, and now I'm addressing people, I can only imagine I'm not, I can't see you, um, is I'm, we're going to introduce each other I'll start uh, by saying, you know, giving a very cursory introduction to Rochuna and, and then a tiny, say a tiny bit about her new book, which is the reason why we're here today, talking about uh, the journeys of the art film uh, in, in India. Um, and then um, once we are done with that, we well, we are going to attempt, although we don't have a moderator to help us, we are going to attempt to do what we want to do, which is hear each other speak about why, why this particular you know, topic or theme or this particular subject is of interest to us and has been of interest to us for a very long time. So we are going to ask each other questions. We are each going to be uh, both you know, presenter and moderator. Uh, in that sense. So um, let me begin um, by saying that Rochana Mojumdar is an associate professor. I mean, you have this information already, but let me say it again, is an associate professor in the departments of South Asian languages and civil civilizations and cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. She is the author of Marriage and Modernity, Family Values in Colonial Bengal, which was published by Duke University Press in 2009, and Writing Post-Colonial History, which was published by Bloomsbury in 2010. And most recently, and this is the book that I referred to earlier, um, Art Cinema and India's Forgotten Futures, Film and History in the Post-Colony, Columbia University Press. 2021. Um, so I don't know if if Zoom inverts everything. Uh, so maybe it has done that to this image as well. But here is the book, which uh, which is a a very absorbing, often gripping book. Um, 
a, a kind of engagement with a, a, a kind of um, cultural, artistic, cinematic history, but also individual uh, practices, artistic practices on the part of uh, th primarily three filmmakers, Shrutujit Rai, um, Ritik Ghatok, and um, Mirnal Shen. Uh, I, I also like um, the various things that are being tried out here, the, the various marriages that are taking place here between uh, history writing and criticism uh, and uh, between the idea of the post-colonial as a parameter, but also ideas to do with the poetic and, and, um, uh, and art, the, 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 the word that figures in the title of our talk today and also in the title of Rochana's book. I think these marriages are more uh, unusual than, uh, than one would suspect. So in many ways, um, those are part of the reason uh, why the book is absorbing, why it grips you. Um, so Rochana, over to you before we start with our tete-a-tete. Uh, um, -tete. Well, uh, Omit Choudhury, for the, for the viewers who don't know him, which I imagine would be a very small handful, wears many hats. And um, he asked me in his uh, characteristic, candid way, uh, why I wanted to be in conversation with him. And I mean, you all know that he's, he's an author, he's a performing artist, he writes on music, criticism, uh, he's a literary activist, a poet. Uh, he's written many novels, three books of poetry, uh, his most recent book, I believe, is Finding the Raga. Have you written something even after that, Amit? I, no. Or am I a little bit? Yes. So Finding the Raga is a book, uh, again, uh, intensely personal, but also a reflective theoretical book on, on uh, music. But my reason for, uh, for asking Amit to... Uh, you know, to, to, to share the platform today is because something that Lekha said right at the beginning that uh, we're both deeply interested in, in Kolkata, our city. And Omit actually is, uh, is someone who, from his works I know, made the decision sometime in 1999, was it, to make Kolkata your home. And I was very interested in speaking with a practitioner who also writes about uh, film occasionally, but that's certainly not the only thing that you write about. But I mean, you have this engagement with, with Kolkata and the world that was in many ways reminiscent of the world that I'm trying to recreate in the book. And, and in lots of ways also not. So I just thought it would be this is not an introduction, but it's also, uh, you know, I'm trying to explain uh, one of the reasons why I thought it would be good to bring uh, or to stage our conversation in the in, in public. I mean, you and I talk over the last two years due to COVID less frequently than we'd like, but uh, let's see where this conversation goes. Absolutely. Thank you, Rochana. And um, so I'm going to so to tell you what I have in mind to start off, uh, let me just say that I'm planning to ask you two sets of questions to begin with. Like, uh, and each one is a kind of a pair. Um, so, okay. so, so one A, one B, two A, two B. Sorry, I hope this doesn't sound like an exam, but um, it's, it's just- And he's also a teacher. So yes. So, so for you to know the structure. Go ahead. Sorry. For you, know what, for you to know what to expect. That's that. I I wanted to cover a few things with sets of questions. Sure. Um, the, so one A one B. So the first question, the first two questions, which I uh, want you to kind of consider. The first is very bland, but I, it's a subject of real curiosity for me. Why did you write this book on cinema on arts? art cinema, art art films. Um, 
given, uh, I mean, I know you are uh, engaged in film, you're part of the kind of film study uh, uh, department I'm, I'm, or, or um, that kind of goes into what you do uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, it is, it is an interesting movement from your previous two books and, and this one, obviously it has been sort of germinating in you and then you've been writing it for a while. So, so this is one question, this, this turn towards something which isn't maybe written about as much as it should be. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, cinema and art house cinema. Then your comment, uh, which you also kind of, I think you mentioned this towards the end of your introduction that you felt that some of the, that this, these filmmakers were remarkable uh, as well. I mean, they began their work in the fifties and then they continue after that. Remarkable for prefiguring uh, um, some of what you know, critical historians uh, would say later on. Uh, so in, in what way for the, for the kind of uh, sake of our audience, I think they would also be interested in this insight of yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, they're both important questions and generative questions. And I hope I don't ramble. If I do, just stop me. So why? this particular topic, I should say that when, uh, when I was growing up in Kolkata, we knew that, I mean, vaguely, that there was, a, uh, there was a distinction between art and commercial films. But in my house, we watched everything. You know, my father was a huge fan of Uttam Kumar Shuchitra Shen, Uttam Kumar Shabitri, Uttam Kumar Shupriya Devi. He watched everything and he he also, he loved melodramas and he would weep copiously. My mother was a little more disciplined and didn't like for us to watch uh, Bengali mainstream uh, or Hindi commercial films, but we did really. And then on Doordarshan, we watched these black and white uh, films. So, you know, I didn't grow up uh, with, how shall I put it, with much of a film taste, taste within quotes. When I joined uh, Presidency College, there was something called the uh, Presidency College Cholo Chitra Shongshot, which is like the Presidency College Film Club, where I encountered many of the films that I mentioned in the book. I mean, not just Ray Sen and Ghatok, those I'd watched uh, mostly on Doordarshan, but many of the non-Hollywood uh, non-Indian films. But really, I hadn't actually considered writing about uh, films in an academic way until I finished my first two books, really. And part of the reason for that, and there's somebody in the audience here today, Ashish Rajadhyaksh. Hi, Ashish, if you're there. It was, um, on the one hand, having friends who nurtured my interest in cinema, like Ashish. Um, but also this peculiar thing where I realized that, uh, that, you know, art films, and this will take me to the title of my book, which I call Art Cinema and India's Forgotten Futures, where I realized that oftentimes outside of Bengal, and I was in Chicago, the names of Ray Sen and Ghatak and many others actually, Adur Gopalakrishnan, even Girish Kasaravali, like Sham Benegal, Sham Benegal the least of all, but uh, say MS Satyu, they functioned like ciphers in the sense that, you know, people would say that, yes, these are films that actually bring India a lot of prestige abroad, but really nobody had seen them. And there was also a very influential body of work that was going on when I came of age as, or as I was coming of age as a scholar of cinema, which was um, sort of finding in popular cinema resources for understanding the workings of Indian democracy. And so it was a weird kind of, uh, you know, an inversion, if you will. So growing up, if there were people who would say, oh, you need not watch mainstream Hindi films, or you need not watch mainstream commercial films, it's too melodramatic, it's too over the top, it's too almost exotic and unreal, all those things that actually take away from respectability 
responsibility in the academy. There was actually, or certainly when I began to take an academic interest in films, I realized there was a huge interest in the popular. And the truth is I wasn't particularly interested in, or I wasn't invested, let's put it that way, in the distinctions myself, but how the distinctions actually played out or how they came to be is something that I found very interesting. And that was something that motivated me. So that's the first forgotten in the book that, oh, who were these people? I mean, who are these people whose names everybody knows? And maybe everyone's seen the Opu trilogy. And when I say everyone, I don't mean people in Kolkata. I actually mean people elsewhere, you know, both Indian cinephiles, but also abroad. And what kind of film culture was it that produced this distinction between art and commercial in the first place? The second forgotten thing that, that uh, or the second way of forgetting that's very important for me and that kind of matured, and I'll say this and keep quiet, that came into being uh, as I was working on the book was that, I mean, I mean, as you know, the book is not an exhaustive analysis of all the works done by Ray Ghatok and Sen, right? I mean, those taken together would be over 100. But I was especially interested in the trilogies of each and not the Opu trilogy. I was, in Ray's case, I was interested in a city trilogy. In Rinal Shain's case, I was interested in his contemporaneous Kolkata trilogy. And Ghatok only made Meghita Katara uh, cloud Cap Star, Shubhana Rekha, The Golden Line, and Komal Gandhar, Gandhar's, um, The Gandhar Sublime is how Moinak Vishas translates it, E-flat. Um, I was interested in these films because to me, they registered what I describe as a sense of disorientation with the post-colonial present, which is to say, and as a historian, I became very interested in in understanding that disorientation, you know, uh, so say if in the fifties there was a there was some degree of assurance in in looking at where we came from and where we are going, which is to say, if, you know, looking at the colonial past and onto the post-colonial future. In these trilogies, I sensed a I sensed this feeling of utter and complete disorientation in very different ways in each of these filmmakers, and a kind of presentism about how to be in this post-colonial present that we inhabit. And that I found very interesting and that's not how we talk about these filmmakers. So that's the forgetting that I wanted to invoke and discuss in the book. Um, so that's a very long drawn out answer to your brief questions, but does that, does that make sense? Absolutely, and it leads uh, to my next uh, two questions. Um, after which, you know, feel free to, uh, if you want, turn the questions yes. back on me. Um, but um, so, so yeah, what you you just said then kind of leads to what I wanted to ask you. Your your um, the connection you make between the first decade after independence uh, in the fifties between a growing sort of um, idea of the importance of good cinema within courts and citizenship or post-colonial mm -hmm. citizenship, as you put it. Um, mm -hmm. And then your, your kind of um, interest in the sort of cinema that arises from you know, this falling off from occupying a citizenly role or persona, if I understood you correctly. Um, and over there, over here, can I just quickly um, make a literary connection, if, if, if that's okay, and then ask you the second part of my question just after that, because I'm responding to everything I read by you, not only as a person who's interested uh, deeply and invested, to use your word, in, in, in this kind of 
in in the practice of of Ray and uh, Ghatok and and others. But uh, as a uh, the investment comes because I'm a practitioner of a particular kind, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so. Um, the idea of citizenship has been something that has kind of uh, interested me deeply um, for a long time. I want to read out this poem. Um, one second. It's called The Novelist by, it's a sonnet by W.H. Auden. Mm -hmm. And this is something he was exercised by and when he says the novelist, he means the 19th century novelist. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he, he's talking about why, why is it that the novelist is so different from the poet? And how is it that the novelist came to be this peculiar uh, sort of creature uh, who can do so much, you know, produce books which are 500 pages long. And also, as, as he says in Letter to Lord Byron, where this preoccupation comes up again, see so deeply into the economic workings of society. This is what he says about Jane Austen, you know, mm -hmm. in a way that poets just can't, you know. Uh, and, and here, so I'm just going to read this very short poem, the novelist, encased in talent like a uniform, the rank of every poet is well known. They can amaze us like a thunderstorm or die so young or live for years alone. They can dash forward like huzzas but he, now this is the novelist is, he's referring to, must struggle out of his boyish gift and learn how to be plain and awkward, how to be one after whom none think it worth to turn. So there's nothing unremarkable. There's nothing remarkable, unlike the persona or the poet, there's nothing remarkable outwardly about this, you know, what the novelist seems to be like. Mm -hmm. uh, for to achieve his lightest wish, he must become the whole of boredom subject to vulgar complaints like love, among the just be just, among the filthy, filthy too. And in his own weak person, if he can, must suffer dully all the wrongs of man. That is the novelist it covering those 500 pages, and he's thinking here about the 19th century novel, must address every character, their, their motives must be filthy with the filthy, just with the just. Um, become the whole of boredom because he has to put it all out there. Unlike the poet who can choose to kind of uh, um, magnify only a particular moment and occupy it momentarily. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the novelist mm -hmm. can't do that. And so it seems that the novelist is a citizen figure. The novelist has uh, um, the kind, un takes on the kind of responsibility that a grown up does, which is why he says, you know, that he comes out of his talent and then learns how to be plain and awkward and then take on these huge ambitions of great responsibility of representation. Basically, the novel is, is seen to, especially with the 19th century novel, to document society, to represent society. Mm -hmm. uh, almost kind of citizenly sort of uh, responsibilities undertaken by the novelist, which are then also uh, part participated in by other citizens who read through novels in a very different way from the way they read poems. That is, they read through enlarging their knowledge almost. You know, mm -hmm. they almost seem to have learned something at the end of the novel, something new about that society, about those people. With, with the poet, he, he seems to think the poet is a non-citizen figure. You know, living alone, dying young, rushing off like a Huzar into the distance, not as assimilated. And so, the, the, uh, so I was interested in your, your uh, description of this falling off from citizenship, of, mm -hmm. of, of opting out, as it were, from, from this particular kind of paradigm of responsibility. Um, that, that, was my, that was what it set off in me, it reminded me of. Um, the second thing I was interested, sorry, this question is rather, these questions are rather long, but I do want you to uh, address them. Uh, the second had to do with your word, the, 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 the word you use post-colonial, which you use, um, you know, um, you use post-colony in the title and you use post-colonial quite often in the book. I was struck uh, by 
certain things in the way you use post-colonial, and I was enlivened by it. You say, I think somewhere that the, po the post-colonial present is multiple. It's not one thing. It's, it's, it's a multiplicity it's of things. It's, it's fragmentary. Um, it seemed mm -hmm. uh, sort of something that one could ally with modernism and with art you know, the, the, the art in your title through, through the, the investment that modernism and art both have in this kind of multiplicity rather than this integrity. Um, and I thought you were opening up the term in a way uh, that it hasn't been, maybe it has been by some others, but, but the dominant term that I'm, uh, the dominant meaning of which I'm aware as a writer and as a novelist is the Saidian post-colonial in literature, where, you know, uh, basically we are looking at texts um, as, as, as sort of um, whether, whether uh, these texts, if you're looking at Western texts, in what way uh, they, they create a, a reality, they create the Orient or represent it or misrepresent it, and in what way uh, rebuttals could be made of, of that particular exercise of power through language, through representation, which happens in various places, including the novel, uh, through writing, say, to, 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 to uh, bring back a well-worn term, let's say, to ride back to the empire. So mm -hmm. uh, with, with, with that Saidian kind of um, definition of the post-colonial, uh, what the, the, the kind of work that emerges from the post-colony is seen as a corrective to that exercise of power by the, right. by the colonizer. It's not really seen in a fabric of its own argumentations and artistic practices mm -hmm. and artistic milieus. It's seen more as a uh, setting the pictures, uh, you know, setting the record straight. Uh, enlarging or correcting the picture. And, and I think you over here are doing something slightly different. You have to with, with uh, Ray and, and Ghatok uh, and Sen because they don't lend themselves to this particular um, definition, the Scythian definition of what a novel does. Um, the post scythian definition, I, sh I should say. So, um, so I'd like you to just maybe respond to these two things. Um, okay. Okay. I think there are again very interesting set of questions. So first is this. I'll try to take them serially in the way that you mentioned. See, because again, Amit, uh, one of the reasons why I hope we get into this, I know that for a while you've been thinking about uh, the role of research, right? In in um, in your own in your own writing and and I want to get to that in 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 some ways because I think the last time that I saw you in person you said that you were uh, thinking of either writing something and I don't know if you have entitled against research um, and I found that to be very very provocative but I'm just putting it out there because I think part of this is also coming from some of those interests but this whole poetry novel distinction that you drew and the usefulness of the novel the uselessness the so-called uselessness of the poet and how the novelist as it were is the more um, citizenly figure in a in a normative sense right and to that you were as you you were asking me about what I mean when I say that the project of good cinema and the project of good citizenship got disarticulated. So let me take that lot first. The story that I try to tell in my book is art cinema, the term, the category. When it first arose, it actually coincided with the coming of independence in the country. And from the very beginning, or at least at the beginning, there were a number of individual state institutions institutions, uh, um, other civil social bodies such as film societies who were involved in giving meaning to this project because there really wasn't, it, 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 the, the, it, it, 
didn't even exist as a placeholder. So once you come up with a category, you also encrust it with meaning. And in this, the work I write about Murray Seaton, who was a British uh, film society activist that came to India, the state, uh, there were certain official commissions, et cetera, that were set up talking about film policy. And there was a lot of cine enthusiasm. And I think, I mean, another thing we need to bear in mind is that it wasn't until the early 2000s, I think 2007, when film as a whole was accorded industry status in our country. So film in a sense, both art, commercial, everything, was like a stepchild to the Indian state. Nevertheless, I think at the moment of independence, many of the people, members of film societies, uh, filmmakers, people involved with the film industry, both in Bombay, Cal Calcutta, Madras, and people who were one to be filmmakers, they, there was a certain enthusiasm with the project of building a new future. And that's where I situate the project of art cinema, that it was, even though it wasn't an arm of the state, it shared in some of the state's enthusiasm to look to a future of a particular kind of educated citizen capable of exercising political and aesthetic judgment. Thereafter, the argument I make is that, particularly among some filmmakers, and surely this would have been shared by some, I'm sure, you know, some lit literatures, uh, theater personalities, I'm sure this thing would have been shared by many. There was a certain disillusionment, if you will, with the project of modernization and development. And, um, and that leads to the kind, the kind of uh, disarticulation, as I say, between the project of good citizen making and um, and state making, I mean, I and here's what I write about it in the book. I say it was as if in the beginning, around 1947, when India became independent, the elite sense of historical time had a unified character. And when I say elite, I don't necessarily mean an economic elite. I mean, you know, it's an elite of education, mainly in it because most of the people that I'm writing about are, are middle class. I mean, teachers, clerks, uh, office workers, painters, uh, professors, etc. Notwithstanding the ravages of famine, war, and the trauma of partition, history in the new nation had a unified telos for its elites, a narrative of transition to modernity. At the scale of the individual and the nation alike, they were committed to a shared single story, a journey through historical time that included many difficulties and digressions, but a journey whose points of departure and arrival were already known. So if, if it departed from the colonial period, it had arrived into a moment of liberation into the, in the post-colonial. For its elites, the nation existed as a pedagogical project where you cultivate a certain sensibility. In this case, if only by making good films, you know, giving people the capacity for political and aesthetic judgment. Its cinema was thus conceived in stride. Good films and good cinema were means of creating good and discerning citizen subjects. This book documents how the aspiration to make good films became dislodged from the aspiration to make good citizens. As that relation came undone in the 1960s and 70s, the consensus over historical time that informed the intellectual elites thinking about the post-colonial nation also changed. And I think this brings into question your point about representation. That, uh, I don't think I was ever talking about representation. And you'll notice I avoid expressions like realism, modernism, because they are extremely freighted expressions. I was talking about the way in which filmmakers apprehended a particular social reality. You can give it whatever name you like. But in a sense, I would say that in the 50s, there was a certain assurance about the narrative arc of the stories that they were telling. I mean, if you take Ray's Opu trilogy, which so many have written about, you know, it's, it's 
boy becoming man, boy having a future, no matter how uncertain, suffering a lot of losses, but it's a story of becoming. In his city trilogies, by contrast, what you have is a kind of stalled present. And you, in, in, in depicting that, I mean, you know, I, I say that Ray becomes, from a historian, he becomes an ethnographer, where all you can do is take stock of what is going on next to you. So if you want to call this representation, it's a representation of a present tense without any sense of futurity. So, I mean, I'm interested in the distinction that you drew between the novel and the poem, but to me, the functions of each are not quite as transparent and as sharply demar demarcated as, as you made them to be. And really, I think um, the burden of representing this reality is where uh, you could call it modernist, you could call it, you know, in some ways, um, and artistic avant-garde sensibility was coming in. It could be realism with a twist, like I, I'm, I'm not really interested in the aesthetic labels once one gives it. What interests me is how people registered their disappointment with the project of modernization and development and what aesthetic means they deployed to, to, to register that sense of, of disorientation. But I mean, in some ways I do want to turn this over to you in a certain way. And, you know, again, once you, you made this remark that, that you became less interested in Ray from the period that he was making Shatranj Ki Khilari. And, uh, and I, was, I found it to be a curious statement. And I wanted to ask you if it has something to do with this other project you have, you know, about in this really polemical kind of uh, collocation against research that you have and do the two come together in your head and if they if they do I'd like to hear a little bit more Amit unmute yourself unmute. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose there are convergences and you know resonances between these you know the, the, the one the statement I'm making here about something to do with my predilections regarding Ray's of and uh, you know whatever I might have said about research there, there must be continuities between these statements um, the, the, the comment about research was made in response to a reality which didn't quite exist when Ray was um, at work even when he was at work on Shatranj Ke Khiladi um, and uh, the comment about research was, I suppose, a, a comment made by a novelist who's been an outsider to this pretty new tradition of the Indian novel in English uh, that one is supposed to be triumphantly a part of, but one is outside of, one feels oneself outside of it. And, um, and making, making sense of, one's lack of connectedness to that milieu one is supposed to be part of as a practitioner uh, in, uh, and the lack of connectedness in successive waves uh, to do with the emergence of this particular form of the Indian novel in English in the 80s after Midnight's Children and first grappling with the idea of uh, a tradition which gives as I said, a fledgling tradition, which gives centrality to the novel and to a particular idea of narrative, uh, and, and Midnight's Children begins to embody uh, those characteristics. Um, and then uh, other waves coming into existence to do with, um, you know, the rise of the historical novel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, so I have argued against all of those uh, at different points of time. And when I made that comment about research, I must have been uh, the, the, the rise of the historical novel and the idea of novelist and researcher becoming interchangeable in mm -hmm. the heads of people around me, um, uh, you know, 
everybody by then had heard of the novel, uh, had, had almost forgotten about it as an entity outside of the Indian novel in English in India. You know, whether we are talking, Great. whether we are talking about uh, the person who's selling pirated novels on the pavement or the people who are buying those pirated novels or the latest Booker Prize winner or, or you know, odd people you meet in the academy, there, there, there wasn't much difference between them in their acquiescing the, uh, to, to the idea that the novel was the central, in fact, literature was the novel. In fact, literature, let's not forget, let's not bother about literature. We only need to engage with the novel and the novel is something that only exists in English as it's written by Indians. Outside of them, uh, outside of this kind of world, what's happened in America, or what happened in France a hundred years ago, or what happened in Bengali or Canada is not of direct interest to us in, mm -hmm. in complicating or enriching our idea of, of narrative or anti-narrative. Um, mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, 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 there, were, the, there were also certain kinds of uh, novels which became, as the 19th century novel became shorthand for the novel at a particular point of time, so that people like, um, Proust or Wolf would have had to work very hard because they were growing, going against the grain of the 19th century novel. And this is where the question of representation comes in because the 19th century novel is seen as a kind of represent a vehicle for representation or for the representational mm -hmm. um, in as much as that's what it came to be seen to be then people who are writing non-narrative, non-representation and novels by the early 20th century, who are having to work hard to make a case for what they were doing. Wolf certainly, because also she, she's a woman, mm -hmm. uh, has to work very, very hard. And that's why she writes criticism. Um, and um, so uh, similarly, a particular kind of novel was now in our heads a, a, as a kind of shorthand for not only literature, but for the novel. And around the 2010s onwards or, or the 21st century onwards, it became the historical novel. And this kind of uh, uh, became a new way of uh, uh, defining to us what it might be to be a post-colonial citizen and to, to learn a great deal from the research that goes into these works about these societies and how these works also uh, correct our uh, uh, the biases of the novel. What what they leave out to to represent very solidly through through research other histories. So the other histories are not approached fragmentarily, but very solidly. You know, right. and and with an attitude I think of mastery, and with 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 the belief that the past is there. It is, it is there, I only need to go and find out about it in the archive, put it back together. And, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's in front of us, I've given it to you in a novel. And, and, and then for the reader, the reader then is no longer uh, open to other experiences to do with writing, but becomes part of this, uh, you, you know, participates in this mastery, in this act of mastery in through narrative. And so I, I would also offer here, well, I learned so much after reading that novel, you know, it was like attending a class. It was back to your early days, uh, Rochana of self-improvement, but in a new way, because, uh, you know, the, the world of aspiration after globalization was quite different from before. Right. Uh, globalization. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, it was all. I think I want to come in. Yeah, I want to come in here and kind of say earlier. This is responding to your question about representation and the post saidian moment. So here's where I think my project differs, and I owe a lot to to what is often referred to as the Chicago film history, who's uh, or the new film history. You know where one would say that. You know, film is not just about representation. Like, it's not saying that, oh, I watched this movie and this was a very true depiction of life in a village in so and so place. But rather, if you want to think of film as an embodiment of a particular sensory uh, experience of 
of modernity. So to take a concrete example, and, and you know, I, I mentioned disorientation earlier, right? I mean, if you, if you go back to that particular scene from uh, Ray's adversary, Pratidundi, there's a scene where, the, where uh, Shiddhatto, played by Dhriti Man, has a job interview and the, he's bombed the interview and he goes uh, into a cinema hall, Metro actually, and it's air conditioned. He just sits down and he thinks that I'm going to rest from uh, this really hot day and uh, a bomb goes off as there's a films the films division documentaries start rolling on screen and there's there's a there's a there's a bomb that goes off and people just start piling out and in the in the sort of scramble his watch breaks now a lot gets packed into that scene right so if somebody watching that scene like you can't possibly say I learned a lot because it begs the question of well, what did you learn? I mean, what was this job interviewee doing in a? I mean, who goes into the theater to rest? What kind of youth goes into the theater to rest? I mean, in other words, this is not about a transparent representation of a reality out there because the reality out there is so confusing and so puzzling that. It's as if the filmmaker says that I refuse to actually give you, give it to you neatly wrapped in a package, which you can then process and swallow. Rather, my task is to be alert to the atmospherics of, of that situation and you know, show it as I'm seeing it. And then let's see where it goes from here. I mean, a lot of people have said that the ending of uh, the adversary with the Ramnam and him finding the bird call at the end is a nice, neat resolution. Now, I don't know that it is. And I don't think that this is actually an interpretive muscle flexing, but it goes back again to the function that you task cinema or theater or literature with. And I think I, think I get what you mean when you say against research, because this is something that would be in common, say, even though you're 30 years later or many years later after these people, it's not as if people undertook research first and then sat down to write. Research is an ongoing process that happens if you're alert to your surroundings. It happens all the time. I mean, right. of course, as a historian, I have certain methods. And in this book, I deploy certain methods to recover certain archives. They're not state archives. They're extremely ephemeral archives of film societies but again i have to decode them to see what aspirations they embody like why would a group of people about a hundred thousand i think at its height of the film society movement why would they be so invested in watching non-hollywood non-indian language films or non-mainstream uh indian language films and that too under terrible conditions like where they had to source films so it it was a certain, if one wants to call, you know, that aspiration research, I'm interested in, 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 in the names, but you see, that's why I was asking you this. Yes. But you didn't get to the Shatranj part, which yeah. I'm very, I remain curious about. Yeah, it's okay, very quickly, because then, you know, I want you to also respond to what I say. Uh, and then we, we should maybe in another 10, 15 minutes, open it up to questions. Um, yes. So, um, just just to add that what you said about research i mean uh, i uh, by the way i completely agree with you about these films that you're talking about or your your sorry i must look for another word besides representation but your representation of pratit dondi or uh, shima Baddha or whatever uh, you know i i agree with uh, with with the way they um, are put together which is why i like them i mean i like i love the early films raise early films uh, very much, but I also love these films, and and this is the reason uh, that they are not solidly put together, you know, and you don't feel that, you know, uh, watching them is a, a kind of quasi uh, form of knowledge. Uh, um, but uh, I used to get this question: Oh, you're a novelist; uh, you you must do a lot of research at a certain point of time from people, you know, I didn't know, but who would have heard. That I'm a novelist, and and I I would say to them, 
yes, I do research all the time. I mean, which you just something you just mentioned. Um, so the idea of research as kind of something you do for a particular product, uh, the, which is the book, is 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 the pro is the model that I have a problem with. Research is something uh, a, a different from that. If we have to use the word at all, now. Um, as far as Ray is concerned, uh, the Shatranji Khiladi, let me just quickly say that, you know, I had in my mind a periodization. So, so there were these early films. When I looked at his filmography today, I found that some of the things that I, ha that I thought belong to different periods or happened, you know, consecutively or one before, after the other, uh, sometimes happened simultaneously. You know, um, so so, but the periodization I, I had in my head was the early films, then the then the middle period, and then this period of uh, Shatran Ki Khiladi. Um, this this man I knew, uh, father of a friend of mine, Dhruva Gupta, had his own periodize. Uh, he, a great lover of cinema, but historian. Uh, great uh, enthusiast of African literature. Uh, yeah. He had his own, yeah, you would know him. Uh, he had his uh, own um, periodization too. And one of the things that said to me also spoke to my own sort of sense of the periodization I had in my head. And he said, with, with Arunne Din Ratri, the reception that Ray got made him lose his nerve in terms of what he was doing. Um, and mm -hmm. therefore he produced Oshuni Shankit. This was his, his kind of analysis, which I thought very funny and very interesting. Um, so, so he was saying that, I believe Ray had, was never as, whatever his manner, he was never a, comfortably a citizen. Certainly mm -hmm. not in his early films, not in his middle period. Um, he, there is, there is just, the, the early films could be a Bildung's roman, but they are an example, just as Bibhuti Bhushan's book is, of how one might take on the subject matter of a build, Bildung's roman, but write about something, do something different. Explore consciousness, mm -hmm. which is what I think Bibhuti Bhushan is doing, and which is what I think Ray is doing. And, and therefore, just as the non-citizen or the one resistance, resistant to citizenship is not easily assimilable. The, the, these early films also have all kinds of non-assimilable bits, um, mm -hmm. uh, longers for the want of a better word. Like uh, for instance, the, the, the famous scene where th there are insects in a pond during the monsoons. And he just spends a, uh, a huge amount of time uh, on, on those insects, which by the standards of any cinema, by the standards of any financier, uh, would be would would be inadmissible, uh, but he's taking his cue from Renoir in from an early film *Un Parti de Campagne*, where he mm -hmm. begins to spend a huge amount of time in what is just a half an hour film, I think, on on the currents of water as it rains, as they're going uh, on mm -hmm. this boat ride in the river, and 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 Renoir himself might be taking his cue from. Um, what Monet began to do with his water lilies, work, rework, rework, and produce one version of after another of a watery fluid scene, versions which no longer remain distinct from the other. And all these are instances of the difficult to assimilate. And so they resist assimilation. And I think Ray is coming from a number of provenances, intellectual provenances in his rejection of being easily assimilable, whatever his positions about new art, art films might have been later on, his his kind of unfair criticism, if it did happen, of Money Call, uh, uh, you know, a filmmaker I greatly admire, and with whom he has a shared temperament. I'm I'm sad that this all, uh, you know, he, his relationship with the other filmmakers and younger filmmakers be, become kind of um, uh, situated in a kind of family quarrel. You know, I love one or the other. This is my, you know, so, so not in your book, I'm saying ge in, in general. Oh, so, but I think but at the same time, it gave this, this period a certain richness. 
it of course that it did. kind of family yes. quarrel that kind of almost blood feud if you will i don't think has been repeated in 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 it, it, cinema it, circles it, and you fight about something when you actually uh, make it you know when it becomes the bearer of many aspirations and you asked about you know what do you mean by the post colonial i think you just answered it it's actually when you can claim as the subject of free and independent india you can claim multiple provenances for your practice in fact you don't even want to be constrained by uh, by saying you know what, which one your provenance is and you don't have to it does not bear the burden of or oh, taking taking from somebody else particularly the ex the ex colonizer that's certainly one aspect of what i would regard to be central to the post colonial stance uh where there's a sense of openness like i mean and you see this in in a lot of third cinema work which is supposed to be i mean say the uh, you know latin american third cinema where they're taking from cine regionale they're taking from chris marker they're taking from newsreel i mean all kinds of people so it's it's almost like protean borrowings but not even with a sense of borrowing because you then put it to to a different use i think where i would push back a little is on this question of why does any of this have to be divorced from the idea of citizenship i mean if if by citizenship we don't mean oh taking an oath of allegiance to the military of the united states army or in this case whatever uh the indian constitution but rather if it's the capacity to to be the bearers of political and aesthetic critical judgment then why would this not be why would good film or good theater or good literature not be allied to the project of making good citizens i don't i don't understand why why you would be resistant to that or maybe this is a a, a discussion we should have separately i mean uh, i don't yeah. see questions yet but um if yeah. there are from from yeah. our audience definitely Please another discussion on citizenship and the arts yeah um so what about questions uh lekha are there any uh we don't have any questions at the moment sorry uh we we don't have any questions at okay. the moment okay so um so manush manush da hi manush da has asked a question okay uh, yeah uh can should i, I yeah yes, please. Uh, can I, should i do it yeah uh, this is uh, from manasri uh, do you think that the category art cinema needs to be problematized in the first place it seems to think that in the self definition it is hugely loaded with what it is not or should not be this is the so called commercial uh, uh, popular Uh, this differential category on which art cinema is premised on gives it a certain kind of ring to it the privileging of the persona of the esthete practicing and patronizing it a certain politics of reception while the uh, while the depiction of a certain kind of cinema as art cinema rarefies art and artistic pr practice it also castigates the popular as one monolithic mass um talking about shaping of nation's future and the associated disappointments one could perhaps argue that was not only art cinema's burden popular cinema for instance the uttam charita melodramas took part in it so sure I, yeah the thing is i sh again i should make it very clear that the category art cinema is not my book is not either celebrating or endorsing it what i am invested in is in understanding what work it is doing in the post independence context from 1947 up until maybe a few years after the emergency and there's no there's no quarrel i think about the proposition that all kinds of films whether it's uttam shuchitra whether it's gurudath whether it's raj kapoor everybody is taking on the burden of thinking about the the, the post colonial uh, situation my brief that i set for myself in this book 
is to understand the particular way in which the body of films that we designate as art films uh, do that. That is not to say that I'm blind to certain biases that, um, that, that these filmmakers might have, let's say, towards the popular. But in a sense, that's what I try to understand, that you know, what, what, what's at stake, in other words, in these projects? Like, why would, because these are, as, as you know, these are filmmakers who didn't just make films. They wrote as much on films. They organized uh, uh, about films. In fact, Adur Gopalakrishnan once made this great comment to me where he said that, you know, I first I set up a film club first because I wanted to cultivate a particular kind of audience and then make the films that I, uh, I wanted to make because I'd be assured of an audience. They experimented with particular production models. You know, they were the early people. And I'm not just talking about Raysan and Ghotok here. I'm talking about people like Adur, later on John Abraham, who ex experimented with a cooperative model of, of, of filmmaking. So it's actually a certain kind of thinking which sought to distinguish itself from the mainstream commercial cinema and got into quarrels oftentimes with each other. I mean, that's why you then have the splintering of the art film into middle cinema, um, parallel cinema, the artistic avant-garde of uh, Kohl and Shani. I mean, it's, you know, just as commercial cinema is not a monolith, so is, so is I mean, so too is art cinema not a monolith. So that I, I want to be very clear on. This book is a history of the career of the term in, in the Indian context during a particular time. Um, we have uh, two, one comment and uh, one question. This is, uh, the question is for Amit. Uh, the comment first from Prabhu Mudlapur. Uh, if you have read Bashir, the Malayalam writer, he's not to be labeled um, like, um, aligning with citizenship, etc. Life is wonderful and diverse, and hence literature or films. Um, the the next question, the, this, the question is uh, from Pravina Cooper, and this is for you, Amit. Uh, even the aesthetic moments, that, uh, movements that you validate, Renoir's water, etc., carry political um, and in brackets citizenship undertones. Correct. Um, okay, uh, so, so can I, uh, before I uh, try and uh, reply to that, uh, but, um, can I just ask Rochana a question? Um, yes. So, so um, what, what do you think happened, what do you think is happening now to the art house cinema movement in India and why is it not as robust as it used to be, and why is it not as robust as it is, let us say, in other countries, including, uh, say, Iran or China? So, first of all, I mean, you'll notice, Amit, in the book, I never say art house, because if you talk about art house, we didn't have them. I mean, Nondon came up in the 1980s, and I think I give a statistic in the book where we have our first so-called art house in, uh, in Kolkata um, in, in, I don't know if I'll be able to find it right. Yeah, so, uh, the, so I, I write, one of the first and few art house theaters, Nondon, was established in Calcutta as late as 1985, 38 years after independence. As a point of comparison by 1950, there were 80 such theaters in America, a number that rose to 450 by 1963. So it's really in the context of developmental scarcity that I, I, find, I found it fascinating to look back on these people, so many of whom remain anonymous, to watch you know, to, to watch movies. I mean, there are, I have anecdotes in the book of how Nazarene, for example, arrived in Kolkata on its way to Burma, I think, and how they had it for an evening and the conditions in which they watched it, I think in Tiger or one of the cinema halls, it's no longer called Tiger. I think it's called Chaplin now. Now, that's, that's the history that I wanted to understand a little. 
what has happened to it now i don't know i'm i do not work on the contemporary but one thing i can say and again i think ashish's forthcoming book will be a very useful one here you know i think for a lot of people who are currently making films even in what we call bollywood for many of them particularly those that trained at places like ftii the body of filmmakers that i'm referring to here not just the indian ones but also uh, the non indian ones they are legacies of those filmmakers i mean ashish has this beautiful article on kundan shah and his jane bhi do yaro where he talks about shah's kind of tongue in cheek debt to antonioni and i think that for a i mean my positive spin is that for a lot of people now this is things are much more easily available and it's it's much more easily a part of their legacy my not so positive spin on it is that you know since the coming of the multiplex i don't think that the distinction between art and commercial works in quite the same way because we talk about niche audiences right and they cater to uh, there's something in them for everybody and um uh, i think that that's largely true i mean i wouldn't know so much about iran but i think that that's largely true in most viewing contexts of the world where you have many more festivals many more screening opportunities and of course your ott platforms which actually bring everything to your house so it's a different kind of screening climate and the last thing i'd say is frankly i don't know what the future of cinema cinema understood in this big way as not just films but a kind of public sphere surrounding films uh writing theatrical non theatrical screenings uh debates discussions what the status of cinema understood in this expanded sense is in not just the digital universe but also in the post covid uni universe i don't know how covid is going to rewrite uh these communities so that's yeah that's not a very exact answer but that's some of my thoughts on on this so i i think Pra pravina cooper made a comment but she and uh, somebody else made a comment about bashir um so um should i uh, just quickly try to respond to the comment but i don't know what what my response would be i i just uh, um i'm i'm going to kind of look at the comment as an opportunity to 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 kind of approach approach it slightly differently i mean uh whatever it was possible that made uh, uh that allowed renoir to take those whatever 2 minutes or so in the in the movie to to show us this uh, is also a part of um the demarcations of the time the political kind of the politics of the time the the economy of the time um so when when i asked you that question rochana i i i suppose what i was saying is um people have had to fight for these moments whether it's within a film i don't know if renoir had to fight for those 2 minutes or with whether ray had had card blanche to 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 have his 2 or 3 minutes to have that pond with the insects or what whatever else he was doing where it was kind of going off in a different direction uh but firstly you have to fight against uh your own education your own citizenship which has taught you that you shouldn't be going off in different directions the hegelian in you which wants to be unidirectional um and and then uh, increasingly the 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 overseers are outside uh and here you know the the word art becomes important in these in certain contexts as place of freedom where where one is allowed to do these things where one is allowed that two extra minutes or as manikal says i like it i don't uh, dislike all uh, bollywood films at all or all hindi hindi movies at all i i quite like hum aapke hai kaun because it, the it, 10 minutes were spent searching for shoes which which wouldn't be generally allowed in a in a hindi film of that time um, that kind of 
longer again. So what, what one is doing, and this has started from a long way back, from the late 19th century, and it started in various genres, cinema, yes, it begins maybe with Ray, maybe there are other people before him who are trying to create that space in which they can take those extra two or three minutes, you know? Um, and um, this, this particular space, which one might call art cinema or, uh, or the festival circuit, which, which, is, which again, shouldn't be generalized and it has its own problematics, still is a space where the kind of cinema which will not be viable elsewhere uh, finds a sort of viability or life, a way of surviving over there. And this is true of, of writing to that, you know, um, publishing houses closed down their poetry lists, most of them in the 90s. So we're looking at the world after globalization, where a different kind of fight had to be undertaken to, to kind of accommodate the non-narrative impulses, which earlier were financed by publishers by selling their commercial books in order for them to publish the more, um, the more difficult books, which nevertheless were interesting books. Uh, that kind of sponsorship just went away. So mm -hmm. the fight, so it's a fight for a particular space to exist through various kinds of sponsorship. sponsorship. Uh, it's a fight for survival. It's a basic fight for survival of a particular impulse. So on, um, that, on that note, um, Amit, maybe we can weave in another comment that has come in, yeah. and I think it, it speaks to, yeah. to, to, the, to this, where uh, Karni Bhati writes, I would like both panelists to respond to the issue of melodrama, which has been mentioned in passing. The term is relevant to both literature, fiction, and cinema, and one might add relevant to the same dis relevant in the same dismissive way as pandering to popular taste. I realize the term encapsulates a lot, but perhaps they could focus their responses in relation to, to, relation to citizenship or post-colonial citizenship. Thanks. I, I think this is a really good question, and I'm reminded here of Gordok's statement that melodrama is my birthright. And it's it's always uh, I've always found it fascinating to ask why he said that. Like, why is melodrama my my birthright? And and going back to to something that you just said that it becomes something to fight for. If I make this film, and if you've seen Gordok's uh, cloud cap star or uh, the golden line and so on you'll know how how overly melodramatic they are and it's I mean you know he is somebody who brings together melodrama with Bertolt Brecht I mean he says that I wanted to hit the audience in the head with a hammer so that they would take notice I mean it's it, the, the 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 scream of the uh, girl who wants to live, uh, you know, in 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 Cloud Cap Star, or the sister who realizes that the first customer as she's uh, sinking into prostitution is her brother. I mean, those are these hyper melodramatic moments, and uh, I think they they sit at an angle, a very critical angle to any received notions that we might have of citizenship, but it actually shows the tremendous pressures that the idea of citizenship in the post-colony is under and how one survives through that. Amit, would you, uh, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? We're running out of time. So I'll just uh, try to quickly sort of, uh, um, respond to what you've said and the, and, and the question and the previous uh, things you know that we were just discussing and then I'll leave you to make the you know the last kind of comments um, so unless there are more questions that are that are coming up um, because I think we do have some leeway with the overall kind of time yeah so one needn't get tense about having overrun um, melodrama. Uh, I want to go back to the earlier uh, things we were discussing just for a second. And, you know, this fight for whatever, while not, I, you know, while not kind of, I, I think this whole idea of dismissing popular culture on the part of 
so-called high cultural figures must be a bit of a myth. And, 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 and I think they would have responded uh, to the artistic component wherever they met it. You know, it's just not true that uh, popular culture doesn't have art. There is a lot of art going on there, but the, but the percentage of where art is going on and where art fails is more or less the same as in art house work or artwork. You know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of artwork, however solemnly undertaken, is 99% bad. 1% of it is great and inventive. The same is true of uh, popular, uh, popular culture, that it, it comes up with astonishing manifestations of what can only call, uh, one can only call the imaginative and the artistic. Um, so, so a lot of that work is going on now, but yet, we now live in a particular kind of hegemony where we are not supposed to use the word art. I'm glad that you brought it in over here. But for 30 years after globalization, uh, after various kind of uh, uh, shifts in the market so that the market became the one way of looking at things. And at the same time in the humanities, the humanities no longer wanted to be seen keeping company with art. And shifts in critical theory uh, made that happen, but ha I have to say that is that too is a, a generalization created by uh, in the minds of the legatees or the proponents of critical theory because Foucault, Derrida, uh, or Adorno, all these people wrote, thought, and were formed by the artistic and poetic experience. But we don't see this in post-colonial theory. Unfortunately, I mean, here I'm glad that you are bringing it in, you're making room for it, you're opening up to it. But at least in the way we look at the post-colonial uh, or, the, or the chief theorists, uh, we don't find, let us say, a, 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 the equivalent of a Maurice Blanchot for, for Derrida or Mallarmé for De Derrida uh, in Said. Said uh, uh, writes about literature as a literary scholar, plays the piano, but those activities do not inflect his understanding in the realm of cultural studies where he does not say, some of the questions I'm raising here are not getting answered by the questions I'm raising. And my, my, the, what I'm playing in the piano is telling me that. This is what is happening mm -hmm. to Derrida, that some of the questions we raise in this academy are not getting answered by these questions. And Blanchot is telling me that. Mellarme is telling me that. That accommodation just has not happened. In, in India and in the post colony. Uh, and, and so I would say from the point of view of being a person invested as a practitioner in the arts, I would say this is a terrible time. It's a terrible time for, uh, uh, for, for somebody who's fighting for, for that particular space because the, the glib rebuttals of it are so, have become so knee jerk now that no one is thinking any, anymore about this particular word we, are so loath to use art and what, what its history is. Um, what, was that, what was the question uh, that I, that you just, uh, it's gone. Well, no, it's gone. It was the melodrama question, but I think we're also at the end of time. So let me perhaps just uh, echo what you said, but also read out from from just the last bit of the book, where I write that, um, and it's not a very long bit, but I think um, it may make sense to actually uh, to end on that note, this note. So I say that, uh, of course, the art cinema I have discussed here was produced in times that were very different from the times we are passing through. But those times and our times have one striking commonality. They are both disorienting. The promise of capitalist prosperity has worn thin for us. The filmmakers, critics, and film society activists all felt disillusioned with the promise of national development. They worked out their own ways of negotiating such times. The art films leave us with roadmaps of the time they inhabited, where the realm of experience could no longer 
be a guide to the horizon of future expectations. We cannot, of course, live out their experiences. The past is indeed the past. But in retrospect, we can recognize in their work the pioneering labor of a certain kind that we also need today. The creation of historical sensibilities adequate to the challenge of disorienting times. It is in this sense that art cinema constitutes for us an ongoing repertoire of resources. And perhaps I'm going to just close with that uh, and, and thank you again, Amit, for, for putting so many ideas on the table and for actually opening my book up to a much, um, much on um, the canvas that you open it up to is much larger than I would have known, but that's always, that's because you're an extremely generative reader and thinker. Thank and you for, for the book, which, which generated these responses. It's, it's wonderful to have this particular, you know, bring the, the, the things you brought together here. Yeah, it's great. And thank you, thank you to BIC for, for giving us this platform for early morning on death. Yeah, thank you so much, Roshna and Amit um, for this conversation and uh, coming from a predominantly sort of, uh, you know, masala entertainment film value and the names of uh, Ray, Gatak, Adur, Kastravali, and Sen may intimidate a lot of us. Uh, but the role of cinema in shaping a young India's identity and personality often goes unnoticed. So thank you for facilitating an exchange that allows us to think about cinema and how one consumes it. Um, thank you again. And thank you, audiences, for joining us today. See you next time. Thank you.